From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Donald Trump will be totally responsible. Printing untraceable guns at home. The president says it doesn't make much sense as several states file suit over plastic weapons. We've got coverage from D.C. on how gun control groups are fighting against the 3D plans. More questions than answers. The Senate Judiciary Committee grilled ICE and Border Patrol over efforts to reunify families. Is it the future of transportation? Waymo partners with Valley Metro to change the public transit system. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Victoria Valenzuela. And I'm Raneem Hamid. Thank you for joining us. Everything's available online, but do-it-yourself guns? 3D printed guns is a controversial topic. A federal judge just issued a temporary restraining order from releasing downloadable blueprints for these weapons. Gun control groups are outraged and demanding that a permanent ban be put in place, as Danny Coble reports from our Washington bureau. Critics are worried that 3D printable guns will be a boon to criminals and terrorists. And Democratic senators backed by gun control groups made a last-minute plea to President Donald Trump to keep the ban in place. So he should fix it before midnight tonight. The ball's in his court. He has a chance to prevent this from happening. Critics say that being able to make a gun on a 3D printer could put guns in the hands of people who aren't allowed to have them and make guns that are hard to detect and impossible to trace. Democrats urged the president to consider the domestic and international issues 3D printed guns could present. Complains about terrorists crossing the border, but he wants to let them have guns undetected. What kind of hypocrisy is this? The plans were first posted online in 2013 by a Texas company, but were soon blocked by the State Department over concerns they would end up in foreign hands. The ban was lifted as a part of a settlement between the state and the company. Despite the ban, however, thousands of people are believed to already downloaded the blueprints, and more are expected once the plans become easily accessible. Not enough. We have to stop it from becoming an epidemic. That's what will happen if it's legal to put these blueprints up. But in a statement, the NRA said that no matter what someone posts online, undetectable plastic guns have been illegal for 30 years. And Charles Heller of the Arizona Citizens Defense League says critics' fears are overblown. Really not stunning or, or, or different then nothing has changed, except possibly some parts might be a little easier to make. Gun safety activists still worry that printed guns will allow people to skirt background checks and say the administration should reconsider lifting the ban. Well, the quickest way for this problem to go away and for this incredibly dangerous security threat to go away would be for the Trump administration to reverse course on the settlement. So far, the only word from the White House is a tweet this morning by President Trump saying that he's looking into it. In Washington, Danny Coble, Cronkite News. President Trump took to Twitter this afternoon to make a statement about the border. He said, quote, I don't care what the political ramifications are. Our immigration laws and border security have been a complete and total disaster for decades. And there's no way that the Democrats will allow it to be fixed without a government shutdown. For over three months, the National Guard has been assisting federal agents at the Arizona-Mexico border, but they aren't carrying guns or patrolling the fence. The National Guard is acting in a support role. None of our soldiers or airmen uh, currently on Operation Guardian support are armed. They're helping out the overall mission, and they're putting more of us out here on the border to secure the border. Since it is a support role, the Guard is doing jobs that can range from using a welding torch to cleaning Border Patrol stables. The federal government is funding the National Guard presence on the border through September. After that, it's unclear if they'll stay. Immigration officials were grilled today over the Trump administration's zero-tolerance border policy, which led to thousands of children being separated from their parents. Senators wanted to know how that policy came to be and why some families are still separated. Pat Pobletti has more from our Washington Bureau. Administration officials defended their actions and policies, with Associate Director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement describing the family residence centers as more like summer camps. 
But when pressed by Democrats, none were willing to say that these holding centers were summer camps that they would send their kids to. Uh, we sit here now in the middle of a humanitarian crisis, largely of the Trump administration's creation. The zero tolerance policy has led to the separation of thousands of children, including infants and toddler, toddlers, uh, from their parents and has intentionally inflicted uh, untold amounts of human suffering. It wasn't just Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee criticizing the border and immigration agencies for their treatment of migrant families, though. They must be kept in facilities where they will be treated humanely and with the basic dignity that all people, no matter what their immigration status is. Uh, unfortunately, recent media reporting I've seen suggests the federal government is failing miserably. A group of roughly two dozen demonstrators also voiced their discontent by staging a walkout during the opening statement of the acting chief of the Border Patrol. Not every senator on the dais was critical of the administration, though. Senator John Cornyn of Texas instead directed his ire at fellow lawmakers, who he claims spent more time complaining about the issues on the border than working to find an answer. Even while many people have been critical of the status quo at the border, even as we work together to try to unify these families, uh, the critics offer no plausible and workable alternative solution at all. ICE Executive Associate Director Matthew Albans defended his agency's policy of deporting parents while leaving children behind. A great many of these individuals do not wish to have their child return home with them. The reason most of these individuals have come here in the first place is to get their children to the United States. The administration claimed it had reunified over 1,800 children by the deadline. But Health and Human Services Commander Jonathan White said that 559 children who had been removed from their parents still remained in custody. In Washington, Pat Pobletti. Cronkite News. Opening statements began today in the trial of President Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort. Manafort faces tax and bank fraud charges. This comes as part of special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation, though the charges aren't related to Manafort's work on the president's campaign. Mueller had 30 witnesses who might testify, and Manafort has pled not guilty. Today was Justice Anthony Kennedy's last day at the Supreme Court. He spent the past 30 years on high court. His vote is credited for allowing gay marriage and helping sustain Roe versus Wade. Kennedy was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1988 by President Ronald Reagan. President Trump has nominated Judge Brett Kavanaugh of the U.S. Court of Appeals as Kennedy's successor. Today, Valley Metro and Waymo revealed a new partnership. Reporter Allison Snell attended the announcement and has more on what this means for the way we travel. Whether you drive a car, use a ride-sharing service, take the bus, or ride the light rail, Valley Metro and Waymo are looking to redefine how we travel. I heard from both the public agency and the self-driving technology company on what their plans are for the next two years. Whether you're sitting at home or sitting at work or your kids are somewhere, they'll call up on this and the Waymo call will come pick them up, take them to that light rail station. Maybe it'll drop them off and they'll go jump on a, a bike share and ride the last little bit to the restaurant that they've already made the reservations in or whatever or, or wherever they're going. And then they'll repeat it going back. That is the future and the future is closer than we, we think. Valley Metro and Waymo are joining together to try and reinvent public transportation. And they're keeping one specific question in mind. Can these autonomous vehicles make it easier for the citizens of Greater Phoenix to get to the infrastructure that people at Valley Metro have developed? They're working to answer that question through a two-year pilot program. The self-driving vehicle does not travel on a specific route, allowing it to attract many riders in any area. With that technology has allowed us to enable and focus on ways we can improve not only transportation point to point, but accessing different public transportation infrastructure. Samantha Jackson is one of the riders who says she'll utilize this new technology. I could take it to the grocery store and I can take it to Target and I can take it to the place where I like to get my nails done and then gets on the light rail to go to her job. And riding light rail, is so it, it just makes me so much happier. With this new pilot program, the expansion could mean Samantha could take Waymo from her home to the light rail, where she could continue the rest of her route. Uh, Waymo spent the last decade working on developing the world's most experienced driver, really so that we can make mobility safer and more efficient as people and goods move around cities around this country. 
According to ADOT, Arizona has had 315 traffic deaths this year so far, and more than 90% of crashes are caused by driver's behavior. Waymo vehicles have been involved in a number of crashes, but police have determined they were all human-caused. In the Broadcast Center, Allison Snell, Cronkite News. Everywhere you drive in the valley, you see palm trees. And when the fronds come down, they no longer end up in the landfill. Coming up next on Cronkite News, how the palms can now become meals for livestock. Coming up, I'll show you what last night's storm looked like on the weather satellite and radar system here at the National Weather Service. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS PBS, preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. The 2018 election season has arrived. Join us for primary and general election debates. Right here, meet the candidates and hear their positions. Arizona Horizon your source for what matters most this election season. Only on Arizona PBS. Here at Cronkite News, we have producers who craft shows that make an impact on our community. Our broadcasts allow students to be involved in all levels of production, from producing to directing. We are guided by highly respected professionals who mentor the journalists of tomorrow. From technical directing to teleprompting and beyond, our production crew works tirelessly to produce meaningful and award-winning shows. We are Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. A nonprofit organization focused on supporting LGBTQ youth has received a $150,000 grant. Nicole Hernandez reports how the money will be used by Glisten. We were ecstatic. It was amazing. Glisten Phoenix had 300 people walk in their pride parade this year. That's up from just 25 people in 2014. We're just we're growing so rapidly. And we're finally at a position where we realize that if we want to continue to grow at the pace that we're growing, we needed more resources. Resources that the Bob and Renee Parsons Foundation had, $150,000. The Parsons grant was like a baby lottery where we're like, we got the grant. Now we can do this, 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 all these things that we, we didn't have the time to do. Things like expanding their education outreach to ensure safe school environments for students. According to Glisten Phoenix, eight out of every 10 LGBTQ students are harassed because of their identity. Between classes and extracurriculars, school can be stressful as it is, but when you add on the fear of bullying or harassment, it can be extremely difficult to succeed in an academic environment. Only 7% of uh, students attending schools um, have access to a school with a comprehensive anti-bullying and harassment policy, which would include specific protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So why GLSEN? All people, regardless of race, religion, root, economic status, sexual orientation, or gender identity, all deserve access. So GLSEN Phoenix is a natural fit um, as it's striving to make a true difference. That was our reporter, Nicole Hernandez. The Parsons Foundation is giving Glisten $50,000 annually for the next three years to reach the $150,000 granted. Reduce, Recycle, Reimagine, a company that makes food for cattle out of palm tree fronds, is moving to the valley. Reporter Emily Richardson explains how recycling fronds into livestock feed helps both the environment and the economy. Phoenix wants to divert 40% of their waste by the year 2020, and one step they're taking towards that is through the Certified Palm Program, which is a partnership between the City of Phoenix and the company Palm Silage to recycle palm fronds. This April, Palm Silage, a company stationed out of Coachella Valley, California, partnered with the City of Phoenix to begin collecting palm fronds from around the valley. Went out 
um, and said, hey, are there any companies out there that can do anything with palm fronds? Palm Silage reached out to the city, said, hey, we make livestock feed out of the palm fronds. And so the city went back out for the request for proposals. And uh, Palm Silage was the selected vendor. We were able to come in and present our business model to them. They fell in love with it. They felt that it met their criteria, not only to take the waste stream, but they really liked the idea that we were taking 100% of that waste stream and recycling it into something good. The company takes dried palm fronds and mixes them with four other materials, including dates that are not acceptable for human consumption to produce natural livestock food. According to Gary Green, Palm Silage is the only company with a product on the market that does not produce any waste. It's 100% recyclable. We use every single bit of the waste product. There's nothing in our process that, that produces any waste at all. Everything is converted into the livestock feed in some way, shape, or form. The exciting part for Phoenix is to have economic development activity here at the campus, create local jobs, and generate economic development around what traditionally has been considered trash, and we we thinking and we looking at it as a resource. Palm Silage, excuse me, Palm Silage will be building a pellet mill in Phoenix within the next two years, but until then, citizens from across the valley are encouraged to take their palm trimmings to the 27th Avenue Transfer Station in Phoenix. Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. Mother Nature unleashed a haboob across the valley. The massive storm knocking down trees and knocking out power. Next up on Cronkite News, crews work around the clock to clean up after the monsoon. Right now it's 104 degrees and sunny, but I know you're curious if there's more rain in the future, so stay tuned and I'll have that for you. Nights at 5 on Arizona PBS. Millions of people die every year from drinking dirty water. I would never have felt I had the ability to do something without ASU pushing me. We built filtration systems out of local materials with the people. To see those kids drink clean water for the first time, it's the most rewarding feeling that you can ever have. I went to ASU because I wanted to change the world. The thing I never would have expected is how the world would have changed me. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5.30 and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most right here on Arizona PBS. Hundreds are still without power almost 24 hours since a massive monsoon storm ripped through the valley. At the height of the storm, more than 100,000 customers were in the dark. Cronkite News reporter Amanda Mason has details on the damage and what's being done to help get power restored. In many areas, people experienced 60 to 70 miles per hour winds, and they were unforgiving. I spoke with Ken Waters, who is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Weather Service here in Phoenix, about the unique elements about this particular storm last night. Monsoon 2018 has not been kind. Um, two weeks ago, we lost about 200 power poles in about 48 hours. That was more than we had lost the entire 2017. The storm last night was so powerful, it uprooted a 5,000 pound tree. And APS has to create a new power grid system where the tree fell in North Phoenix. This storm last night was um, full of wind and we had a lot of outages um, due to wires. Meteorologist Ken Waters says that this storm was different than other monsoons because it was not just a downburst, which is where the storm only affects a localized focused area, but this storm swept through the entire valley. This is before the main brunt of it comes through Phoenix. In essence, this was more of an organized storm system 
where, where it was basically like a big push of, of a whole lot of storms that all kind of came through the valley all at once. Um, the big feature here is the wind. Not everyone got the heavy rain, but everyone got the wind. When the storm's coming close, it, you're going to get more of, typically a lot of storms might give you 30 to 40 mile an hour, uh, but the stronger storms, the more severe storms can get you into the 60 to, to 80 mile an hour range, which is what we saw last night. The humidity is what drives the monsoon, and if levels remain high, I'm there's a potential for another support. severe storm, but not for a few days. Typically, after a really, really big night, uh, we often have, I, I want to almost call it a breather day, where, where the atmosphere has been so worked over that it's hard to get um, really organized storms going the next day. So that's kind of our thinking right now. We're, you know, we've still got a chance for some storms tonight, but we're not expecting a repeat of last night. Water says to take all of these severe warning weather alerts on your phone seriously. Monsoon weather will continue throughout the first week of September. In Phoenix, Amanda Mason, Cronkite News. Another ozone pollution advisory has already been issued for tomorrow. Jordan Doffness is in our weather center. Jordan? Right now it's 105 degrees around 20 percent humidity so it is a little muggy out there due to the storm but not too bad and like they said we are in the middle of that pollution advisory we've been hearing about these advisories and we're going to continue to hear about them through the summer months due to our extreme heat. Now that massive storm did bring us a bit of relief. Just 107 degrees in Phoenix today, the high country barely saw it, the triple digits. Page being the only one at 100 degrees. Yuma was our warmest today at 112 degrees, so not too bad. Now across our state, are we gonna see storms? Not tonight, but tomorrow and Thursday, we are expecting some showers, there's about a 10 to 20% chance. I'm Jordan Daphnis for Cronkite Weather. Some Arizona firefighters are helping put out wildfires in Northern California. The Superstition Fire Department tweeted that three of their own are helping battle the blazes. Captain Dustin Farber, Captain Joe Garcia, and firefighter Chris Ferguson could spend up to 14 days in Redding. They're joining a strike team to assist in the South region. So far, the car fire has killed six people and destroyed hundreds of homes. We may be living in the desert, but that doesn't mean you can't have a sea adventure. Next, how a special camp for kids is teaching about nature and ocean conservation. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wicker Bird. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. If you're looking for one show that tells you what happened that day in the world of business, it's NBR. We saw a classic chip wreck. Nordstrom's opening stores. Triple digit gains. Crude climbs. We're there to help our audience find new investment ideas. The market still has room to go up. Nightly Business Report is the longest running business television program in history. Weeknights at 1030 on Arizona PBS. Arizona is not known for its marine life, but one place is seeking to change that. Reporter Andrew Christensen got a look at how Dolphinaris is ho hoping to foster a new generation of marine biologists. I got to see how Dolphinaris is talking trash, and this time it's about teaching kids how to eliminate garbage in the ocean and conserve marine life, and all in the middle of the desert. Dolphins, not something you'd typically see in the desert. Dolphinaris features the marine animals and offers a kids camp that teaches them about dolphin anatomy. We try to give them all aspects of the dolphins as well as Dolphinaris to work towards that conservation and education program. When it comes to conserving marine life, Dolphinaris teaches about what kind of trash becomes trapped in the ocean. Balloons, paper bags, straws, hoping these young biologists will teach others to use biodegradable materials. 
A lot of kids, it's their first time meeting a dolphin, and they really, really have inspiring moments when they meet them, and we want to use that moment to connect them to the oceans and teach them about what's going on out there. Dolphinaris' Atlantic bottlenose dolphins were also used for therapy. The Sea Star program, special therapy and recreation experiences, helps patients heal mental and physical wounds. We hope that through our education and sharing this information that we have others inspired that we may be grooming the next generation of marine biologists and marine uh, dolphin trainers. Kids also learn about pollution, overfishing and climate change before being able to interact with the dolphins, something trainers say teaches them how to care for the ocean. And when they go and meet our dolphins and really fall in love with them, hopefully they leave here connected to the ocean a little more and because they met our dolphins and care about them. They want to make those changes out in the oceans. A bottlenose dolphin at Dolphinaris died in late September from a rare muscle disease, while another died in May from septicemia, an infection in the bloodstream. Organizations such as Plea for the Sea have called out against dolphin captivity in the desert. In the Broadcast Center, Andrew Christensen, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, we'll talk about GDP growth in the second quarter and what's behind the big numbers. And we'll hear from the many teachers that take second jobs during the summer. It's on the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, starting young. Children learn the basics of economics by running a lemonade stand. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thank you for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.